Hello everyone, my name is John Hammond. Welcome back from the YouTube video, and we're finally back to try hack me. Take another look at some other rooms over here. So let's go ahead, hop over to my screen. I want to showcase the Nax room. So I'm in a cloned copy of the room, so I can put in some answers. But the description here is identify the critical security flaw in the most powerful and trusted network monitoring software on the market that allows a user authenticated execution of remote code or remote code execution. Cool. Okay. Uh, I've spun this machine up. It does say, hey, take note. This machine may take a couple of minutes to boot and configure. So I've already gone ahead and created it. I am connected to their VPN. You can download that file in the access tab if you need to. But let's take a look here. It says, first task is what hidden file did you find? So I'll move over to my terminal. I will make a directory for YouTube Nax. And we'll head over there. Uh, I will get started with a readme because I think that is a good thing to do. I'll drag that screen down and I will take note of what I'm working on here. August, today is the 17th. I don't know if that is when this video will air, but I'm trying to get back into the backlog. So I'm just gonna copy some of these. Okay, what hidden file did we find? Let's get started with our regular enumeration. I will go ahead and end map that box. I'll use TACSC for default scripts, TACSV to scan for versions, and I will output that with the regular nmap formatting to a file called initial in the nmap directory that I just created, and we'll give it the IP address of the box. So that will go ahead and scan while we're doing that. It's safe enough to make a guess that, okay, this will probably have a web server running, so let's just open that up in our web browser. I found this page the very first time I went through this and didn't exactly know what I was looking at. It looks like kind of an ASCII art for the cicada. It says, welcome to elements and there's nonsense down below. Um, and I was like, okay, whatever, that's gotta be a troll. Uh, I went on about my work. I just, let's check in stupid robots.txt. Uh, that didn't seem to get me anything. So I just fired off Nikto. I'd go ahead and like output that out to a simple nikto.log in that directory. And then I'd start to run my other scans. I would then run GoBuster. I am finally on the updated version of GoBuster. I know the internet can stop yelling at me for that now. Thank you. Uh, so now you'll specify GoBuster with DIR for directory mode, specify the URL attack you, and the word list, I am still working with my uh, directory list from regular Durbuster in my opt directory. You can throw that in and it could look for some things. Uh, again, you could pass in TACX to use some extensions like TACX PHP or SH or text or CSS or HTML or whatever you really wanted. But now our nmap scan should be done. So let's take a look at that and see what we have here. We have port 22 open, so SSH. Port 25 open, so SMTP, a little bit of email. Maybe we could do some enumeration out of that. Port 80 open for HTTP. It's a good thing we kind of took a look at that already. Also HTTPS, so we could access that over a little kind of a secure connection there. We also have LDAP, which is kind of funky. We could do some enumeration there. And that's about all that we're looking at. So if we wanted to, we could kick off another nmap scan, this time with all ports. That will take a while, so I will remove those TACSC and TACSV tags, and I'll use an all ports over there. Um, looks like our GoBuster did find a slash JavaScript page, which is peculiar. We could hop on over to that, but we aren't able to get in there. That gave us a 301 and a forbidden, great. Nikto didn't seem to have anything other than index.html and index.php. Interesting that it found both of those. We can take a look and see if they are any different. So if I go to index.html, that's our current page. If I go to index.php, whoa, it redirects me to Nagios XI. Is that 11 Roman numerals? Click the link below to get started using Nagios XI. Check for tutorials and updates. Okay, and that brings me to an actual legitimate website outside of the TriHackMe network. I kind of want to know if this is a real, obviously it's kind of a real service. This is a real technology, real uh, thing, software that could be used in the world. I want to see if there's a version. Okay, yeah, there is a Nagios XI about, and that's a local link. Let's hop over to that access and see if it'll give me any other information. It brings me to a Nagios login. Nice. Viewing the source again. I'm just hitting control U on my keyboard so I can kind of uh, view the source real quick. 
funky JavaScript. There's a lot of stuff in there. Oh, and okay, there's a ton of stuff now. A ton of Nagios links. That's probably a very big thing. I don't know any credentials where I could log in with that username and password. Username, admin, admin, kind of boring, kind of lame. We could start GoBuster in this directory. Now that we see this link, we are in Nagios XI. Let's see if there is that about page. Nagios XI, is that the version number itself? Like Nagios XI, if I just simply Google that, Nagios XI. Is there like a known exploit or vulnerability? Yeah, Nagios XI 5.56. Linux web app. Exploit DB is going to take a little bit of time to load, apparently. Oh. And there's a GitHub page that will allow an attacker to leverage an RCE to escalate privileges to root. Privilege requires access to the server as a Nagios user. Is there a Nagios user? It does this all with a little exploit.sh script. Is that right? No, exploit.php. Running some curl commands, executing things, authenticating. Okay, so it does need to have like our username and password. And that's kind of what the description explained to us already. You'd need to be authenticated. Oh, and this is a Metasploit module. Okay. Before 5.66, module uploads a malicious plugin to the server and then executes this plugin by just issuing a regular HTTP GET request to download a profile for all supported targets except Linux CMD. Interesting. This module uses a command stager to write the exploit to the target. This may not work if Nagios is running in a restricted Unix environment. So in that case, the target must be set to a Linux command. Well, we know we're running Linux because we could see that with our Nmap scan. We know we are kind of in Ubuntu, Ubuntu Linux. But because we already have a Metasploit module, we know we probably will get this to work because Metasploit is pretty trustworthy and stable with the exploits and things that it throws. So it's going to, at least by default, we have to pass in username and argument, but by default, it'll use Nagios admin. Is that a thing that we can just use? Does that have like a, let me get back to the login, please. Slash login.php, that's where it was. Nagios admin. And let's try the exact same username as a password. That's fail, okay. Whatever, how's our enumeration going? We could fire this up and move our GoBuster link, have that actually move towards that Nagios directory, Nagios XI, and then look for more things inside of that. Then we see an images about help and that starts to funnel through. Okay, Nikto didn't really get anything else. Nmap was still doing its thing. So when I was originally going through this, and obviously disclaimer, I have done this before. This is all a facade, this is all act. Entertainment, artifice. Um, I was struggling, like, what the heck do I do? I have no idea what to look for. How do I find an initial foothold? Then I kind of went back to the very, very beginning, the basics of the box. And I, when we went to this page, that index.html, I'm looking at this thing. And I'm like, what the heck is this? Why is this here? And I was remembering, okay, if we're in like a practice war game or we're doing an exercise, we're doing this to learn and there's something in this curated, created exercise, it's probably there for a reason, right? So this welcome to elements thing, I thought was kind of funky and odd. And I was like, these are elements. These are legitimate things in the periodic table of elements. And I remember it and I thought like, oh, oh, the periodic table of elements has like, numbers attached to every element. I wonder if that's a funky thing, trying to encode some silly secret message. Uh, I have no idea. Okay, that is not, I, I wanted to pull up the actual image, not go to the web page. Yeah, these numbers, the, the element number in the periodic table, maybe that is some reference or something that we could end up using for some reason, if that's just here on the page, we don't know why. So we could, convert all those to their numbers. Um, 
and I don't like to do that in a manual way because I think that's stupid and clunky. I wanted to automate it, right? So let me show you this kind of interesting trick. I, Python's my weapon of choice, right? So that's just the first language I'll reach for when I'm trying to automate or script something. There is a periodic table library or module that you can just simply use in Python. So while well, GoBuster has found all this stuff, still none of it was particularly useful to me. It's all 301 redirects because you have to have some credentials to log in with. Let's just turn off GoBuster. Now let's try to work with this periodic table. I'm gonna have to use pip3 because I'm using Python 3 because you should be using Python 3 because Python 2 is dead and off the table. So let's try to create an element parser or something dot pi. Uh, I had gone ahead and just installed or had previously already installed that periodic table. So I could simply import periodic table and that will load just fine. I can run that script and there are no errors. If I wanted to, I could check out the variables inside the periodic table and let's print them out and display them on the screen. There's a lot of stuff here. The way that that works, if I take a look at this page, which will provide no documentation for me, cool. Do you have a home page? It's GitHub, anything, something? GitHub, 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 excellent. Source code, does it use any documentation? Yes, okay, docs are passing on this. Extensible periodic table, periodic table of elements, user's guide, basic usage. Okay, so there are specific objects or variables inside of this module that will represent that element in the periodic table. And you could get more in depth with this. Obviously this is a tool for kind of more advanced usage to do things with actual science <laughs> uh, and important things, do stuff like mass or isotopes or other interesting smart people stuff. Um, all we care about is the element number, right? So is there a number? Thing that we could access? Yeah, okay, there is an element dot number. So let's grab all of these elements. There's four periodic table import elements and that will return kind of an iterable. We could loop through that or we could do kind of an interesting introspective thing because when we're using these vars to get out the variables, that's gonna return a dictionary with like string values for these elements, which is kind of interesting, right? So if I were to do like import periodic table, print vars of periodic table, and then I would get a string of H for hydrogen. I simply have that, vars of H, but I could just as easily grab that object, vars periodic table H, and then grab the vars of it and see what properties that object has. It has symbol, name, number, et cetera, et cetera. So I could just do a dot number on that object rather than using vars. Now I will reach that via a string dot number and I could do that with what this web page offers us, like ag. Pass in ag here and now I have 47, which might be the number that actually corresponds to that. Do I still have periodic table of elements open? Image in new tab, where is ag? 43, 43, mm, 47, 47. That's what it was, great. <laughs> so, okay, simple proof of concept. We've got some Python code that could do this sort of thing. Now let's just scrape out, carve out, grab all of these numbers without having to have to do it the stupid manual way. Yeah, obviously it would, it would only take like, whatever, 30 seconds, but let's, we're, we're smarter than that, we're better than that. Uh, I'll just slap this into a new page in Sublime Text and I will replace every space hyphen with a uh, new line, I guess. And then, so I do that with control H to open, find, replace, and then control enter to replace all. Then I will select all of this with control A, and then I will hit control shift L to give myself multiple cursors in sublime text. And this is kind of handy. Uh, I'll use the home key and the end key to kind of keep all of these cursors in a line. And then I'll just put in the quotation marks and commas as needed. So I could just say elements, now back in our Python code, and I could slap in all of these as a list of strings. So what I could now do is do for element, or I guess for E and elements, let's print out the vars of E and get that number. So now I have all of this information. Super cool. Uh, we could do that in a stupid way with some nice little list comprehension. I'll do 
that entry for E and elements, and let's just make that, um, I don't know, data. We'll call that variable data. And if I were to print that out, now I have a list of these numbers, but all of these could be something more interesting. They could potentially be ASCII characters, right? So if I were to take that decimal number and take the CHR of it or get that ASCII representation, uh, what is that issue? Oh, I need that wrapped around the end of that variable that I'm using, not the end of the list. Now I have something that looks kind of interesting, forward slash PI3T dot PNG. Let me join all that together. And there is a slash PI3T dot PNG. That might be a file or a link or a reference. That's something that we could totally see actually exists or not on the web page, and in fact it does. This little PIAT PNG file. And looking at this, I recognize this because I played too many Capture the Flags, but this is Pete or Piat. I always say Piat, but the internet told me it was called Pete. So whatever you want to call it, the world is subjective. Um, it's an esoteric language, right? Uh, if I were to look for Piat Eso Lang or esoteric language, it is a computer program where all the stuff is made out of simple pictures and colors. They're have to be some resources for it. Yeah, yeah. This program prints out hi, or this program prints out something silly, and it's a smiley face. You could do a lot of cheesy things with it, but that is Piat. So we have potentially a Piat program just in this image. Uh, let's go back to our TriHackMe route, though, because it says, hey, what file did you find? We found this Piat.png. That's what we're looking for. Who is the creator of this file? Uh, let's download this. Let's make a simple directory, like dub, 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 or whatever. And let's w get that file. It's pretty hefty, taking a little bit to download. All right, now we can run file on that, PNG. Let's do some other file reconnaissance. Let's check out exif tool to view that metadata. And the artist is Piat Mondrian. Okay, so cool. This is all trying to point us towards the conclusion that we already came to, that this is the Piat programming language. So we could submit that. There we go. And now that we have this, we would want to run this program because this is in fact a program. I know it looks like an image. When I had done this, I had a little bit of issue. Right, so again, because I like to do this myself, I like to automate, I like to do whatever I can to use my own local tools, I ended up using NPIAT, the interpreter, like the program. You can see this original web page, this home page for the tool has an NPIAT source code or you could download it and you could work with it. You could simply download this tar file, and I'll download that. Let's w get this guy, tar xzvf, X to extract it all. Now I have an NPIAT thing here, and this is the source code. So I would need to go ahead and configure, dot slash configure, and then run it. Wow, I mistyped all of that word. Okay, now I could make it with make. If you try to do this and you get an error, uh, I think I needed to end up using like libgd, libgd dev. I had to install that, sudo apt install. I don't know if you'll run into that, but eventually you will see this NPIAT program here in your directory, and then you can simply run it. So dot slash NPIAT, it'll run the program or whatever you supply. So I would dot slash NPIAT, and then I would try and run it on this file that we downloaded, and it would never work for me. I would get some error that, hey, uh, trying to specify however many steps if I use that tacky e argument, that would still fail. I would get this error like, okay, it's not in a proper PPM format or it's not, it's, it's not running as, uh, with, with enough image data, whatever the case may be. So I was weirded out by this. I would check it out and hex at it. I would do as much as I could with it. It's in the other directory. That's why I can't tab complete it. Even trying to use it on like their online interpreter, because this, this guy, this person on the internet with the homepage, guy who created Pi, it has an online interpreter that you could use. And well, can I get to that please? It's part of his page and I don't know where that link is. There's a try it online, that's it, there we go. 
So I could choose a file and it's in YouTube nax dub 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 pyat. I am not a robot, at least according to the internet. And I can upload an execute and I'd still get this error. What the heck? So I ended up having conversations with like the author, like with the person who made this room. And I messaged him and we were chatting about it in the Try Hack Me like room help channel in their Discord. And he added this, this message. If you get an error running the tool on your downloaded image about like an unknown PPM or format, just open it up with GIMP or another paint program and export it to the PPM format and try again. Uh, I did weird things like using an older version of NPI to see if that would work. I think I got it at one point to work, but I had like a weird carved out file. I don't even know or remember what I've been using, but let's use that GIMP utility, obviously that he kind of recommended. And can I open this and just drag it in? Fire up GIMP, pull in Pyat. There we go. Okay, now let's see if I can just file export as like a PPM. Pyat.ppm, will that work? Export it as raw. Let's see if that will do it. Is there an export as where it can just like show show all files? Oh, okay, there are some options here. PGM, PNM, PPM. Okay, and it will specify another format. So I'll just make a duplicate export and make it, I'll, I'll use the ASCII one just as well and see what happens. So now I have Pyat PPM. Two, one is ASCII text, that's funky. Is it like literally ASCII text? How does that work? Cat that? Uh, I don't know about that. Whatever, let's try NPyit 13F, run it with our pyat.ppm. Okay, now there's a ton of stuff on our screen. Uh, does it do the same thing with Pyat 2? Yes, it will. Okay, so either of those in their PPM format will work just fine for us. Uh, a lot of nonsense in here, right? So you could specify limiting the steps. This circular look to this, this is kind of a loop in Pete or Pyatt. Again, however you want to pronounce it. That loop is just going to be printing out this message over and over and over again. So let me limit that a little bit. There we go. Now we have Nagios admin. Okay, seemingly as that username that we saw. Percent N3P blah, 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 blah. And then we go back to Nagios admin. Okay, so there's no new lines. This is kind of confusing, but maybe this starts and ends because of the Nagios admin. I'll take that. If you need a little bit of clarification on this, there is a hint here. Obviously, we found this username Nagios admin, and we also saw traces of that in the Metasploit module that we were looking through, right? What is the password that you found? The hint explains that percent sign is a separator. So let me grab up to back to where we see Nagios admin again. Slap that in. It said, what is the CVE number for this vulnerability? This will be in the format CVE and then its numbers. Uh, we had that open in exploit database, privilege escalation, and this is the, or this is a script for it. This is the other tab that has the Metasploit module. So that CVE number that exploit database will give us is 2019-15949. Uh, Let's paste that in, try that out. CVE, that thing, yep. And what I should have been doing while I've been going through all that is putting all this information into our script page, but I failed to do that. Uh, I like to do that just to remind you, hey, that's good practice. Now that we've found our vulnerability, let's go ahead and exploit it. We'll use our Metasploit module associated with this exploit. Cool, okay, so that's the one that we saw with exploit DB already. If you wanted to, if there wasn't a Metasploit module, you could do simply searchploit. Nagios XI, and that'll re return whatever as many uh, possible potential, maybe this will work, exploits or kind of abuse and techniques you could use. Let's use the one that is noted though with that Metasploit. And I'll zoom out here so the search exploit can actually finish its sentence. Chain remote code execution, Metasploit, remote code execution, remote code execution, authenticated remote code execution. And maybe that's the Ruby script that we're using. Anyway, let's fire up MSF console. See how it looks here. Gotta take a second to start up. But we could just as easily, now that we have these credentials, log in. Let me go grab that password again, if you wanted to. 
we go to our Nagios XI, go to that login and kind of poke around Nagios admin, paste that in. Nope, I don't need that last pass, thank you. And there's like, hey, there's a new version, please update. Don't have all of these actual remote code execution errors. That's funny. But there's a lot you could do in here, obviously. This will actually give you, okay, their backend admin panel for the service and the software. But Metasploit's ready for us, so let's go ahead and search for Nagios. And there's a lot in here. Uh, we'll specify stuff that's Nagios, like XI. There we go. Now I can see one exploit that uses authenticated remote code execution that is relatively recent with the same CVE year as we expected. It has an excellent rank, so that's probably what we're looking for. We could use that exploit, and let's go ahead and submit that into TryHackMe, because that is what it's asking for. What's that full path starting with exploit for this exploitation module? Let's use that. Let's mark the other one as completed, because we've started up MS Hub Console. Let's check out our options here. What do we need to actually provide? We will need our L host, so it needs to know how to get back to us. Uh, we could simply use, or sorry, set L host to our interface, ton zero. Show that op options one more time. URI path shouldn't be necessary. Thankfully, you can see whether or not some field is required within MSF console. And obviously, we need a password. We're having that Nagios admin by default, but we do need to spe specify a password. So we just figured that out. Let's copy that guy in. And once again, we will set password. Nice, John. Slap that in and run or exploit. Oh, and we actually need the target itself. Duh. Okay. That will just be our simple IP address for what we're looking for. Set our hosts to that target. And there we go. Run or exploit. and It'll fire it off. Starting up a handler on our IP address. It found the version. Looks like it is vulnerable. So it can upload this plugin which successfully uploaded. And then we will wait for the plugin to request the final payload. It'll send the stage. And I remember hanging here like just for a while. It says, okay, cool. We got a Meterpreter session opened and there we go. Now we are finally all done. Now that we're in Meterpreter, first thing I like to do is like figure out where I landed or who am I acting as? Who did I land as? So I would simply get UID and I'm root. <laughs> Okay, so we won, like that's it. That's the end of the game. We own the box now, because we're root. So let's hop over to the root directory, knowing that we have actual permissions and privileges to do that. And let's check out that root.txt file. Nice, done and done. Since we are root, we have owned the box, so we can very easily go get that user.txt. I, I was reading locate user.txt and I almost called it loser.txt, which, you know what, if we're root, we already are. They all are losers. Gallon. Gallon is the name of our user, so let's hop into his home directory. What do we got here? We have a user.txt. So we can simply cat that out, and that is victory. That is the end of the game. Okay, so we showcased a couple interesting things here. Uh, I know we didn't spend all that much time diving into the internals of Nagios. Um, in this case, we just didn't have to because, okay, there's already a known and public and openly out there in the world vulnerability that will just offer you remote code execution seemingly as root and prove us to that. So that's kind of crazy and that's kind of cool. We did a little interesting things with the periodic table of elements. Maybe that script or this for some reason, this module could be handy for you in the future and being able to carve out some elements or however many elements or whatever you want. We did an interesting thing using vars of the object so we could actually retrieve variables and attributes and properties inside that module, treating them as strings because that's obviously how we're going to get this data in. We wouldn't be able to just like a, a dot .ag without knowing this without a context. So that's kind of handy. That's pretty nice. And obviously a little bit of NPy it. Obviously it'll be to Pete itself, um, showcasing those issues and those interesting things and that tack E command and how you can convert it to a PPM format to actually work with it within the program. Okay, that's a lot of talking. This has been a long video. We're already at 30 minutes. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, 
please do press that like button. Maybe leave me a comment. Maybe subscribe. You know I'm super duper grateful. It feels good to be back in the zone, hopefully, to get a little bit more Try Hack Me content out. Hopefully, we'll be doing some other cool, interesting stuff. But I did want to showcase this room because it had a couple of those gems with Pete and uh, that periodic table off the library in Python and just some neat tricks. Alrighty, thanks for watching, everybody. Take care. I'll see you in the next video. Love you. With the